of the room can see and hear us better. Does that work for you? Works for us. This is Kevin Daniels. And I can tell you from experience, he's a wonderful speaker and a wonderful Christian. Here is Kevin. Thank you all. Can you hear me back there? Good to go? All right. I'm Kevin Daniels. I am the current state president of the Frederick Douglass Foundation of North Carolina. I've been president of this chapter ever since it's been started back in, I'd say, late 2008, early 2009. This, uh, we're a national organization, and this is actually the first state chapter that I've been leading since then. Um, I'll speak for a few minutes, and then I'll introduce who I call the, uh, the Babe Ruth of, of, of speaking, because he comes and, and clean the right up, so I'm going to just set him up. We are an organization, and a public policy and educational organization, and we look to advance faith, family, and freedom to every community in America. Every community, regardless of creed, color, doesn't matter. Faith, we're devoted Christians. Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. That's what we believe, and that's what we're going to stick to. We're not going to waffle. We're not going to bend. We're not going to fall. We're not going to compromise. Not for anyone. It doesn't matter who you are, Republican or Democrat. That's what we believe, and that's how our issues are shaped. Back last September, uh, we, we, we were at the forefront of the movement to get the marriage amendment on the ballot. I know that's not a popular topic, but that's who we are and that's what we did. We started out with a press conference and we were heavily involved with that whole process until it, until it got passed. We know that because of our faith and what we believe in, that marriage was established, not yesterday, but back in the book of Genesis. Yep. Marriage, is a, marriage is, a, is a union between one man born a man, one woman born a woman, married to each other one at a time. And we have to be careful to put that born a man and born a woman because there's a lot of manufactured men and women walking around here now. The second thing is, we're, 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 we believe in life. You know, life from, from the womb to the tomb. We are an advocate of life. So when I say pro-life, it doesn't just talk about abortion. It talks about even when, even when you're, you're an elderly. We support life. And there's an organization that I, I'll say right to the camera, I despise Planned Parenthood. Yeah. And everything yeah. that organization stands for. The second thing I said is that we're about family. When you look at the black community, abortion has decimated our community. Our population since the year 2000 we went from 14% of the national population down to 12% of the population. We're at a point now where, I think this happened last year, a year and a half ago, where so many babies are being aborted that we can't even replenish our population. That is, that is horrible. I'm against abortion. I'm about life. I'm about family. Right now, it's 71% like of the babies born into the black community are born into single parent homes. We know what happens to a community when there's two parent homes. The family's stronger, there's certain values, there's certain things that the children are taught, which they pass on from generation to generation. Now that we have single parent homes, we know what, we see what has happened to our community, and that's why I'm such a strong advocate and a strong supporter of, of the Tea Party and the Republican Party. It's, it's about principles. It's not about personality. It's not about people to me, it's about principles. What the Republican Party, what the Tea Party stands for, and if I would say one thing that I would, I would strongly encourage the, that this, this group to do is when I look at diversity, you know, people have asked me to come and speak a lot about diversity. I'll tell you what, I'll be honest, I'm sick of talking about diversity. Thank you. Thank you. What I like to talk about is diversity of message. What do we stand for versus what they stand for? How, how are the principles that, that we hold near and dear, that we live by, how that has been tested and proven time after time after time to succeed, and how the principles that they push time after time after time has been tested and proven to fail every single time. That's the type of diversity I'm interested in. I'm also interested in, in helping to take these principles that we have and to help shape it and to help put it out there. For example, when we talk about taxes, you know, tax, we don't talk about taxes. If 51% of the population doesn't pay taxes, and I go to them and say, we want lower taxes. We're talking to foreign language. Because they don't pay taxes in the first place, so how is that gonna to relate to them? 
But what we do is we take that message and we make it personal. We go up to that individual, we talk about how North Carolina has the highest aggregate or highest collective sales tax in the Southeast. So if we lower taxes, that loaf of bread that you go buy for your child will be cheaper. That gallon of gas will be cheaper. That milk, that sweet tea that we all love so much. And I'm a Yankee, I didn't know nothing about sweet tea until I came in here. We I mean, all the best tea guys. So I want to thank you for, for introducing me to that. But as, a, as an organization here in North Carolina, since the year 2008, when, when President Obama was elected, the number of registered black Republicans in the state dropped off by about 14,000. We went from 50,000 to 30 something thousand. Well, I'm happy to say that within the past year and a half, that number has increased by about 2,100 because we've been out here working, pushing the message of the Republican Party, of the principles that, that, that we hold near and dear. Also, what we've been able to do in this state is, um, you know, we've been helping to, to change the, the, the image, so to speak, of, of the party. We're involved in everything. My hand is in, in everything. I, I, I'm at a point now where I actually work for the state party. This is the first time that this happened, from what I hear, in a long time. That they have never had a brown fellow to work, and I'm, that's caramel complexion, that's my, my skin tone. <laughs> so they have never had a, 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 a young man, young brown fellow to work for the party, to serve as a consultant. And not just a volunteer, I get a check. <laughs> that's, and I say that because that is, that is, that is an important step. Activity is a message. I want to say that again. Activity is a message. If you go out and you be active in the community, don't just invite them here, go give them. As Christians, the Great Commission in the book of Matthew says, go ye therefore. We have to take that same approach and go ye therefore and go get them and bring them here. The people that are here today, that they said, they were invited. Somebody went and got them and brought them here. That's what we have to do. There's a, there's a group in Greensboro called Conservatives for Guilford County. Last year, we invited them to a community cookout. And they bought some supplies and, and, and they started to build relationships with the community. Well, this year, they donated, I think it was about 600 book bags to, and this is the black community. And they have people that are involved in their group center because they went out and they engaged. They went out and they got the people. They didn't just invite them, go get them and bring them in. That's what, if, if, if I would give you anything, if you take anything from what I said, I would say that. I would strongly encourage you to go get them, to go bring them in. Once you get them, if they stay, it's up to them. But I would strongly encourage you to go and get the people. Go get them, bring them back in, and I'm going to cut it short, because I'm going to introduce Babe Ruth. <laughs> I have his bio in my pocket, but I don't, I don't need it. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna speak from the heart uh, for, this, for this gentleman here. I met, I met uh, Tim Johnson back in 2008. Uh, this is at a time where I wanted to get involved in politics. And I was, I was kind of lost. I mean, I went to just help out anybody, you know, working, working, working in the community. Um, you know, because when we look at, I, I, I worked in the community for about eight years, working for a nonprofit organization in, in uh, Alamance County. And when we look at the preamble to the Constitution, it has five elements in order to form a more perfect union. The fifth one being to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Our posterity is the youth, the people that's coming behind us. So I was so active in the community, I wanted to get involved with politics and I wanted to find out you know, what's going on. Why are the conditions in the community looking like this? Why is this side of the neighborhood this way? And then over here has manicured lawns. And, and nice homes, and, and I grew up in housing projects. I grew up on welfare. So I wanted to get more involved. So I just got on Google, you know, you know, internet, that thing that Al Gore created. And I got on that, <laughs> and I Googled black Republicans in North Carolina. And the name Timothy Johnson came up. I didn't know who this guy was, so I just sent him an email. Hey, I'm Kevin, and I want to get involved, and you're a black Republican. Where can I find you? And he invited me somewhere. And I drove a few hours, about three hours down to Asheville to meet him. And uh, we talked, he was, at this time, he was chairman of the Buckham County Republican Party. He had an event, we talked, and it was good, and then I drove three hours back home. But he opened up something in my mind at this meeting, because I wanted more. 
from what I heard, it was a candidate debate. I, I, I met some good people. I wanted to get more involved. Well, I didn't get in touch with him for a while. Well, next thing I know, he becomes the vice chairman of the North Carolina Republican Party. Wait a minute. A bunch of racist people. Yeah, yeah, I'd like a black guy to be the vice president of the state party. What's going on? What I'm hearing in the community that I grew up in and the people that I'm around is this one thing about Republicans, but a brown fellow was up there and the, as the vice chair. So I reached back out to him. And he invited me to come and watch a movie called My Offer 21. How many of y'all heard of My Offer 21? Oh my goodness. We need a My Offer 21 night. Uh, this deep part. My Offer 21 is, you got the video? Yeah, he'll, 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 he'll explain that. But um, I went and watched this movie, and this movie actually changed my life. It changed my life and my wife's life. Because we actually, from that point on, that's when we got involved. But Tim Johnson, when he saw me there, after the film, he pulled me to the side and he asked me a question. He said, listen, I got this organization. Do you want to run it in North Carolina? And I said, no. <laughs> he said, all right, well, let's meet and let's talk about it. So we met, you know, he came up to where I lived and we, he came to my job, we sat and talked. And uh, he asked me if I wanted to do it. I didn't want to do it. He said, pray about it, come back with a yes, let me know when you want to stop. <laughs> <laughs> so I went home, and I still didn't want to do it. And I told my wife, now this is the choice that I had at this time. It was either be the state president of the Frederick Douglass Foundation in North Carolina, or be the vice president of the NAACP in Alameda County. Hmm. I'm thankful that three years later that I made the right choice. <laughs> Tim Johnson is a man that has traveled all over this country, um, speaking to various groups, champion Christianity, champion for being an American, and a champion for being a Republican. He served 23 years in the Army, retired. And his, what really drew me to him wasn't so much his accomplishments, but it was his passion. It was his passion to help people. And that lined up with what my passion was. And you know, he's a high little fellow. That helps too. But you know, it, it was something that, that just drew me to him. It was his passion to help people and to and, and a cause that he believed in. Tim Johnson, this organization that Tim Johnson founded, he's the founder of the organization. It is the largest black Christian conservative organization in the country. And, I, and I'm not bragging, I'm not boasting, that's the truth. In the entire country, this man started this organization. He also, through this organization, there's several pieces of legislation. There was a Trent Frank, congressman out, out of Arizona, proposed a piece of legislation called the Frederick Douglass Susan B. Anthony Prenatal Non-Discrimination Act. How many organizations do you know that's this, that's, that, that's this age, that's a predominantly black organization, not limited to, but a predominantly black organization that has their name on a piece of legislation that's Christian, conservative, Republican. That's an accomplishment that, that shouldn't be you know, over, overlooked. He's appeared on Fox and Friends. He's been on numerous radio stations, other TV shows. I mean, and he's just a guy that, that, that I look up to and I'm proud that I can call him not only a, a mentor, but, but, a, but, a, but a friend. So I would like to introduce the Babe Ruth of the Frederick Douglass Foundation, Dr. Before I go on speaking, there's four things I have to do. First, give an honor to Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. He is the head of my life. He is the head of everything that I do. Without him, I would not be here today. I think that is so important because oftentimes I hear people talk about being true conservatives, but I very seldom hear somebody say I'm a true Christian. And I want you to understand what that means in this day and age. Because nowadays, we're going through some serious trials and tribulations. I don't think the Lord is too happy with us. He's looking for some people that really are willing to stand up for Him. That are willing to shed their blood. That are willing to do the right thing according to His calling. We say that we are Christians, but when it comes down to reality, many of us are faking the call. Right. So we've got to start calling it because the word also tells us that whenever you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you become a minister. 
and that is your responsibility to talk to your brother. Does the Bible say, I am my brother's keeper? We have to understand that. So the first thing I do is give honor to him, give him all the praise and glory, but without him, none of this would be possible. None of you would be standing around today or sitting. The second thing I have to do is give honor and respect to my wife. <clears throat> For those that had an opportunity to meet her while I was the vice chairman of the state party, she traveled a lot with me. We're now living in Atlanta, Georgia. She's an educator. She's back in the classroom. She's excited about that. And so uh, I think it's important because doing this business is not easy. Oftentimes when I travel, I don't realize that while I'm out here speaking and running my big mouth, I figured out I had a big mouth when I turned 40 that I was going to keep talking, so I need to figure out a way to make some money using my mouth because I was going to keep talking. But I didn't realize how much stress that puts on the family. I really did so during my tenure as the vice chairman for the state party, it really became obvious to me that in doing this work, just as it is as any other people that have been public figures, as I'm sure it has been for our judge and our candidates and everybody else, this takes a lot of time and energy. It takes a lot. It's great to see Dee and Bro doing things together because it really does take that support of your spouse. So well, regardless of what you're doing, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for all the hard work you do. And please always recognize your spouse because they're there for you even when they get on your nerves. I can get away with so my wife is not here. Even though they get the nerves, right? That you know they're supporting. The third thing I want to do is all veterans, please stand up. All veterans, please stand up. Thank you. The one thing that I personally think that we have an obligation and responsibility to, my son has been in the Army for 10 years, he's been to Iraq three times, but we need to also recognize all of our veterans each and every day. We talk about liberty, we talk about freedom, but we don't recognize the sacrifices that each one of our veterans, to include myself, had to make. I'm an only child. And I don't know if you understand what that means, but that means I would have never had to go in the military. But I served 23 years in this country, and by the way, I am not an African American, I'm an American. Yeah. I'm not a first generation American, I'm not a second generation American, I'm not a third, I'm an American. This is my country. All 50 stars, 13 stripes, red, white, and blue is mine. I ain't going to Africa, I ain't never been to Africa, I ain't lost that in Africa. So I say that to make it very clear because we believe in those values and, and as you read and understand about Frederick Douglass Foundation, we are devoted Christians first and foremost. First and foremost. Every position we take, we can go back to the Bible and validate our position. We ask the side on the other side, show us in the Bible that supports your position. And you know, they don't do that. Somehow because the word is not what they're guiding their lives by, that's a problem. Because they're guiding their lives according to man's law. And man's law changes all the time to fit the accommodations and the situation. We are proud Americans. We're not proud African Americans. We're not proud European Americans. We're not proud Irish Americans. We're proud Americans. We have as many whites in our organization as we have black. As a matter of fact, a little side note of history, Frederick Douglass was married to two women. His first wife helped him escape from slavery. They were married for 40 years until she passed away. His second wife was a woman 20 years his junior, and she happened to look like the vast majority of you in this room. And he died in 1895. Could you imagine what he went through? Are you understand what I'm saying? If Frederick Douglass, who had been enslaved, who had been enslaved, could be so far ahead then why aren't we doing better as a community among ourselves? The fourth thing that I always have to do is I have to thank you all for being here. Thank you for the time that you've taken out of your schedule to listen to me run my mouth for a couple minutes. But more important, I thank you for all that you've done. Back in 2010, when the Republican Party, for the first time in 140 years, took over the General Assembly, I was part of that. Let me tell you the one thing that I did that nobody else in the party did because of people like you all. I said if it hadn't been for the Tea Party, we would have never had that success. I reminded them, and Dee can tell you, I reminded them publicly. Why? Because I understand the value of what you bring to the table. I understand your passion. I understand sometimes why you disagree 
and yet we're still agreeable. I understand why you say the things that you say to our party officials, be it Democrat or Republican, independent, libertarian, whatever you may want to call yourself. I understand that. And I applaud you because you're at least passionate for what you believe. So thank you for all that you do. If you don't hear it enough from a former party official, if you don't hear it enough from a black guy, if you don't hear it enough from anybody else, I want you to hear it tonight. Thank you. Because you all have made a huge difference in our country. Regardless of what MSNBC says, regardless of what CNN says, regardless of what that net case that they call a DNC chairwoman down there in Florida says, Y'all know who I'm talking about. I don't need to call. I'm doing like the judge. I ain't calling your name. I'm just saying. Right? Regardless of what they say, and just to let you know my true conviction, in 2010, I spoke at the Congressional Black Caucus defending the Tea Party. And if you don't know what the CBC is, that's the Congressional Black Caucus, those people who are really a waste of time and space. You heard like Maxine Waters? Yeah, I knew y'all heard of her. And that guy called Charlie Rango, I still don't understand how he keeps getting real. He's an embarrassment. But these are the type of individuals that are out there talking about that you all are part of the Jim Crow crowd, which is really funny to me because last time I checked, I thought Jim Crow laws were passed on the Democrats. <laughs> the Tea Party wasn't even around. And Republicans had nothing to do with Jim Crow laws. But this leads right into what I want to talk to you about. And I just want to talk to you for a few minutes and I want Kevin to come back up here and we're going to take some questions. Because Kevin runs the largest chapter. And of course it didn't hurt that I was here to stay as the vice chair to get that going. But I want us to ask some of your questions. But I want you to take this turn. And I'm going to build my conversation with you this afternoon on this one word. It's called embrace. And embrace has a meaning. If any of you have ever heard, you know, I like to come up with meanings for words because I think it sticks in your head, but more importantly, it causes you to do some things beyond just the obvious. Embrace stands for enhance my mind by becoming racially aware and culturally slash community educated. Enhance my mind. Let's start off with that part because what I've learned in my time both as being the vice chair of the state party, being the county chair, being the founder and the president of the Frederick Douglass Foundation is the first struggle that most of us have that we don't like to admit that we have is we haven't let go of our own personal stereotypes. I remember hearing somebody, let me give you a couple stereotypes that have always intrigued me. The first one was when I was in Buncombe County as the chair during 2008. And I was telling the lady, I said, she said, well, when did you become a Republican and why? And I started educating and I talked about the Klan and I said, well, it really bothered me when the Klan, when I realized that the Klan came out of the Democratic Party and how could I be a part of the party that's instituted in, ushered in the KKK. And she said, you know, I didn't, Realized that I thought the KKK came out of the Republican Party. <laughs> now, I always love it because people say I've been a Republican for 100 years, and I'm thinking to myself, now, how long have you been a Republican again? <laughs> you didn't know that basic fact. But the challenge is, is that most of us don't know much about the Republican Party. And even though the Tea Party was founded not that long ago, very few people can talk about the Tea Party and its beginning and how it began. Oh, I'm sure there's one or two of you in here, but very few of you know how the Tea Party began. And actually, the Frederick Douglass Foundation was actually incorporated just before the Tea Party began. So we have a similar history. But I bring that to your point, of, I want to bring that to your mind, because I want you to understand that the first thing you have to do is you have to enhance your mind, which means you've got to get rid of some stereotypes. The other point that a gentleman made to me says, you know, it's hard for me to believe in Johnson talking about me because, well, blacks just aren't Republicans. And what was intriguing about that is if we go back to the beginning of the Republican Party, if we go, come back to the beginning of the Republican Party, March 20th, 1854, does anybody understand why it was founded in the first place? The Republican Party I'm talking about. See, 
see it was the anti-slavery party. As a matter of fact, if you end up in Tampa in a couple weeks, you'll be able to see the display where they'll have a pins, and the pins will say, Republican Party for niggas. The pins will say this. Republican Party for niggas. Not Negroes, niggas. Democratic, Democratic Party for whites. But because we don't know our own history, we find ourselves in these struggles. Because we don't know our own history, it's very difficult for you to relate to me. Because see, you don't have that toolbox full of tools. You don't understand that I've got to prepare myself for the conversation that I know I'm gonna to have to deal with. If you've ever been a Democrat, and I'm sure there are one or two of you in here like me, you already know the conversations that are going to happen when you start talking about Republican this and Republican that, especially with Romney and Ryan now. You already know. The question is, what is in your toolbox? And how have you enhanced your mind? Here's a class of one that I love with black folks in particular here, Blake. They, they say, well, when it comes to a President Obama, because we continue to challenge his Christianity because there's absolutely nothing, let me say this one more time, there's absolutely nothing that is validated that he's a Christian in my mind. Amen. Absolutely, unequivocally, nothing. So they'll say, well, we support Obama. Yeah, we don't agree with the same sex. And yeah, we know how he, he, he supported, he's being supported by Planned Parenthood. But, you know, we're not voting for a pastor. We're voting for a president. Oh. Well, we're not going to support Romney. Well, why aren't you, well, you know about his religion. Whoa. I thought you just said you're not voting for a pastor. You're voting for the president. You see, we have to understand that when we enhance our mind, regardless of what your perception may be about Mormonism, unless you've taken the time to talk to a Mormon, or you've been out to Utah like I was this past spring and stayed at a Mormon's house for four days and went to their church and had a great interaction with them, I'm not going to become a Mormon, but I better understand Mormonism. And because I understand Mormonism, regardless of my Christian, I'm not through and through Christian. I'm not going to use that as my leverage point when I know the man is at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue has done absolutely nothing to give me any indication that he's a Christian. As a matter of fact, as far as I'm concerned, he is the worst kind of Christian. Because he will call himself one and yet do everything that goes in just the opposite direction of Christianity as we know it today. So we've got to decide as a community, first to enhance our minds. The next thing that we got to do is we got to start being honest about this racial stuff. Look, don't get mad at me because my suntan lasts a little longer than yours. I know winter is on this way and some of y'all gonna get pale again. That ain't my fault. But my blood is just as red as yours. And if you need a blood transfusion, my job is to help you as best as I can. I hurt just like you hurt. I want the same thing you want. But you also gotta take the time to understand my background. I'm not asking for sympathy. Whatever trials and tribulations I've had in my life, I did that myself. It wasn't because the white man held me down. I'm so sick and tired of that statement too. But what we have to start doing is being willing to recognize that even through our differences, look at what we have in common. Look at what we all want to have. Look at what the opportunities we all have because we're Americans. Those are the kind of conversations we've got to start having. But unless we're willing to start having those conversations, you're not gonna have a more diverse group in this room. I'm not saying that everywhere you go, you gotta talk about it all the time, but if this man wants to talk about it, let's talk about it. If you got a question, ask him. Ask her. Stop being afraid of what? They may say no. I used to ask women on a date all the time. They might say no, hey, you might just go to the next one. <laughs> no, they ain't gonna kill you. They may not tell you what you wanna hear, but they gonna tell you what you need to hear. 
Why are we scared to hear those kind of things? And then we've got to get out of this preconceived notion that because I look Hispanic or I look Mexican or I look Cuban, that I'm here illegally and that I speak Spanish. I got some kids in my family, my children, they don't speak Spanish. And you might look at them and say, well, they just came across the border. My kids, the children I raised. Because unless you understand their culture, my, my son is very hip. Both of my sons are very hip. But you have to understand their culture, you have to understand their community. And ladies, get out of, ladies and gentlemen, get out of this outreach. We do a terrible job of outreach. Because when you're reaching out, imagine being in an ocean and somebody reaches out to you. Unless they're pulling you into the boat, it really doesn't matter. You're still going to drown. Are right, you understand what I'm saying? That's what we like to say. We're doing an outreach. How about embracing me? Not for who you want me to be, but who I am. I don't say that, that you got to agree with everything I say. I don't say that you have to like everything that I'm about, but embrace me, respect me, because one of the sins that we all have is embrace the vision. When each one of these candidates is running for office, the first thing they want is they want their team of people to embrace. You may not agree with the way that I respond to this question. They may not agree with how I dress, but I want you to embrace my vision. Am I right, Judge? D wanted you all to embrace the more T citizens. That's why you guys are the largest in the state. Not that you agree with everything that happens here, but you've embraced it. So what makes it so difficult to embrace me? Don't assume that you know me because of the color of my skin. Don't assume that you know me because I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, and I'm not from Pinehurst, North Carolina. Don't assume that you know me because the media says that all black people think this way and well, you're another black person, so you must be like all of them, all of them. Why would you be any different? You see, when we start embracing each other and recognizing the value that each one of us brings to the table, then we'll have a unified America. I love this country. I believe everything that this country stands for. I believe in our Constitution. It is the greatest document ever written on earth. That's why it stood the test of time. But we have a responsibility. And let me all ask you this question, because I, I, I don't, I don't want to get too deep in the conversation without really get you guys and get involved. But how many of you, Tea Party was started when? Does anybody know? When? When was the Tea Party started? I'm not talking about more, I'm talking about Tea Party <laughs> What's the start? Yes, ma'am. What year was that? 2009. 2009. 2009? Did we go to 2009? Okay. How many of you were politically involved prior to 2009? Raise your hand. Why is that not the whole room? Now, if you just got involved, the average person that looks like me, average has never been involved politically. Kevin's talked about 51% don't pay taxes. A lot of them look like me. A few of them look like you. So if I've never been involved, why are you upset because I'm ignorant to politics? When you were just as ignorant not long ago. See, let's not all act like we all been on this train for a long time. Oh, I understand you might have some time under your belt. You might even be a registered Republican, but you stop going to Republican meetings, you stop voting for a Republican candidate, you stop even telling people you're a Republican. Because you were so disenchanted with Republicans. Anybody want to disagree with that? I think not. I mean, I can take estimates around the country. That, that'll work. So why are we getting upset with people who look like you and look like me, who still aren't engaged, who are still apathetic, who still don't, and when you talk about Constitution, look, we have people emotionally upset about Medicare, Obamacare, but they still didn't understand about the Constitution. 
We got people that call themselves Christians even in this room who have never read from Genesis to Revelation. Oh, they'll give you Matthew 3.16 or John 3.16 and Matthew's this and Psalms this, but when it comes down to really understanding the word, well, they're not there yet. But they'll call themselves Christians. And we'll have people call themselves a conservative, but let me tell you something about the word conservative. If you really want to go history, Democrats were conservatives before Republicans were. We were original radicals. How many of you knew that? That's our history. Guess what the Tea Party is? Are <laughs> right, you understand what I'm saying? If you really understand the Tea Party and where the Republican Party used to be, we were radicals. We weren't conservatives. We went against the grain. We didn't go with the grain. We weren't looking for popularity. We were looking for doing the right thing. Does that sound like the Tea Party today? If that means taking on a Republican, so be it. If that means taking on a Democrat, so be it. But right is right, wrong is wrong. Y'all got me? So there are a couple things I want to do, and then I want to open this up because I see we're out of time. A couple things I want to encourage. I have a few of these. I don't have a lot. But these are our calendars. How many got a calendar before? Did it help you? Is it a great little tool? It's 365 days worth of Republican history. Then I got some questions on the back that really when you have fun with some people like the black political history, the untold story. I love this because when you start asking these questions, people really just get so upset. They're like, I didn't know that. I, I know. I, Y'all, yep, I know. Like the Civil Rights Bill and the reason that we, could, we always talk about JFK and Lyndon Johnson really couldn't stand blacks. Y'all do know that, right? Yeah, Lyndon B. had nothing to do with the real passing of the 1964 bill. That was a big lie. He voted against the same bill that was introduced on the Eisenhower in 1957. That's a whole other story. Okay? So if you'd like to get one of these, these are five dollars. I have a few of those with me. Kevin talked about Mile for 21. Mile for 21 is about black genocide. North Carolina is featured very heavy in this because this is about, this is a two and a half hour video. It gives you an in-depth history about a genocide, black genocide, and how it relates down to the black community, who were part of the proponents that were Republicans and Democrats were part of this. We have a lady in here named Elaine Riddick who was sterilized at the age of 14. You probably heard about some of this in the news here recently. Elaine said there's not enough money that the state could ever give her, so she's not going to agree to the 50000 that's currently on the table and some other things. This is a worthwhile video. If you really want to understand some of the challenges that we have in our communities today in North Carolina, this is worth it. This is $10. I have a few of those. How many of you know about David Barton? David Barton, if you don't know about David Barton, you should look up wall builders. David Barton is an excellent, excellent speaker. But there's a gentleman by the name of Reverend James Taylor. And he does kind of an interesting take on what David usually does in his black and white and some other things. But this gentleman talks about why he's a Republican. He's a black preacher out of Oklahoma. Had a great conversation with him. He is a member of the Frederick Douglass Foundation. That's 45 minutes, but I think it's a worthwhile video for you if you'd like to get it, learn more about it. You might even eventually want to try to get him here to be a speaker. Uh, I have these for $5 if you want to get one. But this is 45 minutes, and it's really worth it. And I will tell you, at the end of it, he says, he shows up two pictures. One is of Al, of, uh, Al Sharpton and Jesse Jackson. He says, the reason I'm a Republican because they're Democrats. <laughs> See, you gotta get that one sold real quick. Huh? You're like, I want that. That, that's it, that last one. <laughs> and let me leave you with the last thing. Frederick Douglass Foundation, as I said, was started by three gentlemen. Myself, a gentleman by the name of Re Reverend Dean Nelson and Troy Rowland, who at the time was the vice chairman of the Michigan GOP. Uh, we made history back in 2010. Hopefully some of you read about what we were doing and the fact that we were promoting uh, the number of black Republicans running at the time, especially right after Obama got elected, we're very proud of that. And we've been in the newspaper in some fashion or another since March of 2010. But we were not able to do it without the help and assistance of individuals like yourself. We are not a black only organization. As a matter of fact, we want to eventually take over the throne of the NAACP. For those that didn't know, and for those that didn't know, you don't hear this often, but I'm a past president for the NAACP as the first vice president for all of Europe. The NAACP was started by a white woman named Mary White Overton. They forget to tell you that little bit of history when they're talking, when they're so anti-white. 
but they began because of a white woman. And W.E.B. Du Bois betrayed his country and betrayed black folks, and that's why he gave up his citizenship in the United States and went to Guam, I mean, Guyana, for those that didn't know. Those are facts, not opinions, facts. So we want you all to consider, we have a simple membership, $35 an annual membership. There's a wealth of information we send out on a regular basis. I would love for you all to really strongly consider if you'd like to become a member tonight, we'd love to have you. Uh, we have a summit that's going to take place in a variety of other activities. We're already getting ready to have a big activity uh, that you all are going to be a part of. Uh, and I'll, I'll let Dee tell you more about that as we get some things in, in place. But it's going to be a big event that more tea parties, I mean, when we more tea party, more tea citizens is going to be heavily involved in. So I thank you all. Let me open this because I know it's about time to close up. But let me just open this for Kevin and I. Thank you all and God bless. to anybody, but I do it because it's needed for clarity. Because we're so clearly a Christian organization, that bothers people. If you notice, we become too politically correct. I've coined a phrase, I'm not politically correct and politically direct. I don't have time to be tap dancing. Uh, and if you notice the atmosphere that we're having in our conventions and other events, we're too politically correct. We're scared to talk from a faith-based perspective. And we're scared to speak honestly and openly. And I know some of the BS that happens within the state party because I've been part of the party leadership and establishment. And anybody that knows crap that happened to me in the past knows some of the things that happened. Um, so they're not going to have a person like me speak uh, because I, I pose too much of a threat, to be honest with you. And they won't have me speak because they say I'm too much like him. <laughs> I've heard you both separately, and you're much better together. Thank you. Uh, one, one phrase that comes to mind is, I call it uh, a lost generation. I'm older than you guys. I'm, I'm over 60, like a lot of us. Um, and I grew up in, in New Jersey, and there was a spattering of, of black students, calling them friends. We got to socialize. But my relationship with them is different, personally, than I see black youths today. For some reason, something happened. You, you mentioned the genocide. And I look at these young kids today, and they've been poisoned to believe there's nothing for them. And I don't know, could you give us some signs, because you see more than we do, a glimmer of hope of what you see for, for the, this generation of young black youth. There, there, there's hope, you know, not all is lost. You know, as long as there's life, there's still hope. And what happened, one of the things that happened in our community, I chalk it up to leadership. If you have failed leadership in a community, that's gonna reflect. Poverty and racism is big business. A lot of people talk about war's business. These guys make a lot of money off of, off of talking about racism and talking about poverty. They, they have all of the answers, but the problems continue to get worse. So when you have a, a group of leaders that have been there forever, and they, they, they pull on people's emotions, when you look at the civil rights movement, it was about getting access to something. These people are preventing us from having something. Same thing with today. Look at the debate during the healthcare debate. The Republicans don't want you to have something, which strikes an emotional core, which the wall's gonna go up. So you're gonna be against them. So when you have these kids, being raised in these type of environments. Now look at look at the top 10 cities in the country, the, the, the most poverty-stricken ones, the most poorest cities. They're run by Democrats. Liberalism is terrible, and we all know that. But these, these leaders in these communities have such a stronghold, they have such a grip on the community that, that it's gonna take people like, it's gonna take all of us to be able to, to, to break down those strongholds. A lot of people don't like Michael Steele. I give Michael Steele credit though. He's on MSNBC. 
challenging them. He's defending our positions. We have to get to that point to where we're calling up liberal and Democrat radio stations, challenging them, going to where they are, challenging them on their positions, letting them know the things that they're doing is, is terrible. Now, if we don't get involved, if you look at the poverty-stricken areas, that is gonna to happen to us. Because this whole redistribution of wealth, ten plan, uh, one of the planks of the uh, Communist Manifesto is to get rid of the property class, to get rid of the middle class, and we see that happen. We see them taking over so much that they wanna get us to where everybody else is. So it, with that, to answer your question to deal with the youth, we have to change the leadership in the community. I'm delighted to hear from you both tonight because I have been very active for years since I we took an early retirement from the Navy after 22 years service. <laughs> and, and that was to become, come home and be a full-time mother. But I have, I have something that disturbs me a great deal. I have been actively involved in trying to witness my love of Christ to blacks on the internet, one of whom is a Buddhist member of ACORN as a black man. And, and several who are socialist whites, and they are a tight click, and they hate. Every time you try to witness in love, and in pointing out the very things that you're saying, you're a bigot, you're a, and, it's, and they have tried to put me down so many times, and I just keep coming back, because I'm just not gonna give up. But we need people like you, because they're not gonna listen to a white woman. I don't have their experience, and yet, we had integration in the military and it worked beautifully. And we learned to respect one another because of the very things you said. But boy, we need more who are like you and articulate because without you, they're not gonna to listen to me. Thank you, thank you very much. agree with you about the motivation of Mr. Sharpton and Mr. Jackson. I heard Jess Jackson on TV, must be 35 or 40 years ago, where he was preaching and he got carried away and he was preaching the destruction of everybody that looked different from him, and even though the first part of his sermon was about the other way around. I understand what you're talking about, I think, about the hold that those leaders have on a lot of the black community, not all of them, but a lot of them. So how do we do anything about that? Well, it, it goes back, that's, that's an excellent question. It goes back to what I said about this toolbox. We've got to first take the time to recognize our own challenges and stereotypes that we have. That's the first thing we have to do. Uh, and that's a challenge for a lot of us because looking inside of ourselves, doing that self-assessment is not something that many of us want to do because we're going to find some things that we're not happy about. The second part is that we've got to be willing to have some honest dialogue and to really understand things that we thought was this way or the intent. And then I think the other part of it is, and Kevin said it earlier about, not just saying we want to invite somebody to come to a meeting, but you go pick them up and you bring them here. And you let them know that it's okay. You know, that, that, that you're not going to be singing out because you're like, yeah, you may get a little attention, and I'm going to tell you, you're going to get a little attention, but we don't have a lot of black people to come to our meetings. Uh, but, I, but it's going to be done in warm not because we want you to feel all of a sudden ostracized, but because we want you to feel included. We want you to feel that, wow, we're really excited to have you here. I think there are some very clear steps, but we've got to start recognizing that we've got to have some communication and some dialogue with each other about those issues that are affecting us that we may have been scared of talking. Dee and I were talking about something. Dee said, you know, I'm so comfortable, I can say these things to you all. Well, it doesn't need to just be Kevin and I that she can feel comfortable with. And some of you will say you've got, you got black friends, but you've never, had it over to your home for dinner. So are they really your friend? I, I know some black people that well, we get along real well, but we've never had coffee together. See, black folks monitor those kind of things. If, if I'm as a politician, and this is one of the things that I'll give you a class is that Richard Byrd does this all the time. As a politician, I come in, I say what I have to say, and I leave because I got somewhere else to go. I can't stand that. I think that's the worst thing for a politician to come in, say their little two cents, get their political speech in, and then leave. Because you're not trying to connect with me. <laughs> Same thing applies. When you bring me in, take time to get to know me. Don't assume that because I'm here, I, I, bought, I bought in. We've got two blacks here, outside of Kevin and I. 
You don't know them. And if you let them just get up and leave without taking the time to introduce them and ask them, are you coming back? Ask them, what do you think about this meeting? That's on you. Regardless of they may have come here to see Kevin and I, you have an opportunity because they're here. And if you don't reach out to them and embrace them and let them know, and if they're at a church, I want to come to your church. If they got another organization, can I come to the meeting? If you don't do those parts, don't get mad at them because they don't show up again. Because you didn't do your part. You understand what I'm saying? You've got to participate in this process. And you've got to do it unabashedly. You can't be scared of it. He's not going to bite you. She's not going to bite you. Right? These aren't the zombies. But we act that way because of whatever perception that we may have about people. So the way to do it is just start step by step. Step by step, but be sincere about it. And if you're sincere about it, people will feel it. You'll know it. And you'll get the response that you want. That's what I believe. Yes, sir. I, I uh, should have asked him, and I'm stepping out and asking. I've always wondered about this, what I see as a double standard, and it, and it was particularly uh, blatantly obvious to me uh, recently when we had the marriage amendment uh, vote that it's. I don't know if it's a factor of political correctness or what it is, that it's totally okay and in fact the norm uh, for black churches to be politically active and yet I see pastors and white churches that are afraid of losing their uh, tax exempt status just to say just about to say anything from the post. Is so, that just so let me, Judge, let me just bring that up. I just brought that up, didn't I? So let me tell you a little bit. First of all, there's never been an organization lose their 501c3. In the history, never been an organization lose their 501c3. Never. Look it up. All the threats that you hear constantly, it's never happened. Okay? That's number one. Number two, many churches do not have a 501c3. Do you know why? Because our Constitution allows for what? Churches to be considered what? Nonprofit organizations if they're ministries. So you can't lose what you don't have. <laughs> Did you know that? The other thing is, this is why I say go to David Barton. Because David Barton and a, a group of other groups of organizations will tell you the history of the role that pastors had in the revolution and everything else since. So we've been playing by this. And here's the problem, especially within the Republican family. We play by these rules the Democrats don't. The NAACP is about as political as political going to be. The black churches are very political. They out there register people to vote, and they ain't registered to become Republicans. <laughs> Believe that. Kevin and I have been blacker than longer than most of y'all. <laughs> you understand? So I heard what was even said by, by the members of the CWA, and I'm telling you right now, if you want to get in the game, you got to play by the rules that are set. You didn't make the rules, but they are the rules. Stop always wanting to be apologetic. If you are affiliated with the Republican Party, be affiliated with the Republican Party. Stop apologizing about it. That makes you look and sound weak. If you are independent, be independent. If you're a Democrat, be Democrat. But we sound too weak when we always want to be wishy-washy and go back and forth. Well, we're nonpartisan. What does that mean? What, what does that mean? Or we're center-right. What does that mean? There is no party called center-right. And in New York, you have a conservative party. We don't have that in North Carolina. You see, we hurt ourselves by some of the things that we say because we don't sound definitive. Whether you like me or not, you're going to hear the same thing from me wherever, you, wherever I am. I'm consistent. And what we have to be, especially with our churches, is consistent. And, with all, and I'm going to say this my final note. We need our ministers of the gospel to start standing up for righteousness. Right. Let me tell you, let me just say this one last thing. And if they're not going to stand up for righteousness, you need to stop going to their churches. That's right. We have one last question. Go ahead. And that, with, with the 501c3, that's where, what he was talking about before, educating. You know, knowing about history. The same guy that the black community hails to be the champion of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Lyndon Johnson, is the same person in 1954 instituted the 501c3 because he was mad at two 
Christian organizations. He wanted to silence them for political gain. We have to know these things. That's another tool in our toolbox that we can use when we're, when we're, when we're challenged by a lot of these people. Somebody asked something about Jesse Jackson. Jesse Jackson goes wherever the money is. In 1973, he spoke at the Republican National Convention. Jesse Jackson, before, prior to him running for president, said that, what did he say about uh, abortion? That, that about, about abortion being, uh, being black genocide? He said abortion was black genocide. Until 1984, he decided to run for president and he needed some money. He said the most important civil rights issue is a woman's right to choose. These guys go where the money is. These guys, as J.C. Watt said a long time ago, these guys are poverty pimps, these guys are race hustlers. And I stand by that position. Matter of fact, I talked about it, I'm gonna plug the movie. I'm gonna plug the movie, because we in it. <laughs> How many of y'all heard of a movie called Runaway Slave by C.L. Bryant? That movie, uh, uh, Tim and I are in that movie. We both got two scenes apiece. And what I encourage everyone to do is to, to call Regal Cinemas and to request that movie. They're only gonna show it by demand. So you have to call them, I don't know the number, but we can get you the number. Call Regal Cinemas, request that movie, and then we got people in the film that are willing to come and speak at the, wherever they show. Me, Tim, C.L. Bryan, I don't know, Alvina King, John Tedesco was in, and, and the scene that was in North Carolina was myself, Tim, his wife, Latessa, John Tedesco, uh, Major Dave, Felice Pete, the president of the Wake County Republican Women, uh, Chris Malone, who is, he, he was, um, uh, uh, what's that thing, school board in Wake County, Bill Randall, and Laura Long, who was president of the Triangle Conservatives United. So um, we can get that number to Dean, Regal Cinemas, Seal, Bryant, Runaway Slave. We would, we would be glad to have that. I, I want to mention something. Um, there is a lady here who's holding my hand because I think she's shaking a little bit. <laughs> Her name is Jennifer, and uh, Jennifer just said something that I want you all to hear. Will you say it in your own words, Jennifer? Sure, I just think that you know everything, that I, all the information that I got tonight is very interesting because you know, it's a lot that you don't know. So I just think that a lot of people need to get more informed about all this information. And it's grateful that, you know, it might change my mind at the polls. So we'll just have to see. You go, girl. Thank you. There is no question in my mind that exactly where I thought these guys were coming from is where they were coming from. And Kevin and Tim, um, good friends, better friends, because we spent two and three quarters hours at lunch talking and listening. And it was, it was wonderful then, and I think you'll agree that it was wonderful now. Let them know, please. Thank you.